Good day. I'm here with Professor Richard Larson of MIT, who's going to tell us a little about his year as president. So, uh, Dick, it's great to have you here today. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your name, what you're up to these days, and about the time when you were in Forms president. Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, it's an honor to be uh, called to, uh, to participate in this effort. I appreciate that. My name is Dick Larson. I've been on the MIT faculty for over 50 years. I'm what they call an MIT lifer. I started as a freshman at age 18. They've yet to kick me out. I, I might be setting some records here. Uh, I'm an operations research faculty member at MIT. My current uh, position is with the Institute for Data, Systems, and Society, which sounds like operations research to me. And uh, my uh, new title is Professor Post-Tenure, which means I gave my tenure to somebody who's 30 years old who can become assistant professor going up. And uh, 2005 was the year that I was uh, honored to be uh, to serve as uh, INFORM's president. Um, I guess that's it. Oh, and I, I'm still doing operations research. We're doing operations research right now on COVID-19, and in particular, how we can home in on uh, small clusters of infection by opening manholes sequentially and looking at uh, COVID um, remnants in, in, in sewage sludge. Uh, it, it doesn't sound very romantic, but it's very exciting. All right. So Dick, how would you define operations research? Would you say that it's math, management, science, a combination of all of the above? Excellent question. Uh, when I'm asked questions like this, I always like to go back to the founders. Philip M. Morse, former professor of physics at MIT, uh, was the founder of operations research in the United States. He was asked this question numerous times. He always gave the same answer. Op quote, operations research is research on operations, unquote. Now that may sound silly, but I think it's profound because what it says is operations research is research and you're focusing on operations. So it's a discovery science, the discovery engineering, whatever you want to say it. He was a physicist. He co-invented operations research uh, in the United States to, to, for the World War II effort. And from my point of view, I view, I've always viewed operations research as a branch of physics broadly defined, which it has math involved, it has management involved, it has the social sciences involved, uh, an OR person must view themselves, I believe, to be successful as multidisciplinary. So you can't narrowly take one discipline and say that's, a, that's an OR person. An OR person, to be successful, I believe, has to have that, that, that breadth. But it's always the discovery. It's not just routinely going through algorithms or routinely going through textbook things. It's discovering new things, new physics, and complex operations. Our field of operations research has gone through many twists and turns over time. Uh, if you think back to 2005 during your presidency, what were the dynamics around OR, MS, or even analytics at that time? Well, 2005 from this, the date of this interview is about 15 years ago. So I had to go back and look at my notes to remember some of these things. But uh, in 2005, um, the profound effects of Moore's law, Moore's law, which, you know, from the about 1960 on, said the power of computers will double every two years. So we had about 25 doublings. And so focus of algorithmists who said, well, I can reduce my computation time on some complicated OR algorithm by five or 10%, that throw out the window because that was no longer relevant. The computers were so fast that most of these algorithms, they, they, they could solve problems much, much, much larger uh, than before. Uh, also, in terms of statistics, we used to use the word statistics for data. Uh, mm -hmm. All of a sudden, that became analytics. And so analytics uh, started, that, that, that word became more fashionable in the profession because you could get reams and reams of data to do analytical uh, analysis on uh, in, in that uh, uh, area. I had done a little bit of that myself on something called the Q inference engine. So that was going on. At the same time, it was a very exciting period, uh, brand recognition for operations research was a problem. And so um, uh, I always viewed operations research as the world's most important invisible profession. And uh, <laughs> it's unfortunate that it's invisible. So at that time, we had OR, the science of better. 
we had hats and we had t-shirts, oh, are the science of better. That was you know, maybe partially successful, at least it excited us. But even to this day, 2020, when we're talking now, uh, brand recognition for operations research is a problem because if somebody at a party goes up to you and says, oh, uh, you're uh, whatever, whoever you are, you're Larson, what do you do? Oh, I do operations research. And by the time you get to the rest of that sentence, their eyes have wondered and they're thinking about something else. So we still have the problem for brand recognition and I hope, I hope we resolve it soon. We're going to ask you to think back to 2005 again and tell us what you're most proud of accomplishing during your presidency year at INFORMS. So getting back to 2005, uh, first of all, in terms of things I'm most proud of, I'm proud of uh, not destroying the ship, keeping the ship afloat and, 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 and going, going straight ahead. But we had uh, several things. One is we were, we were wondering, were we reflecting our OR approach to our clients and to our research uh, people that we worked with, were we reflecting that back into INFORMS? INFORMS had thousands of members. Were we using the OR approach thinking about how we're relating to the OR members? Not really. So we decided to send out a questionnaire, a survey questionnaire, and we got lots of responses back, both master's of, of, of graduates and PhD graduates, and asking them how we could provide better services, how INFORMS could provide better services for our members. And the overwhelming answer was lifelong learning opportunities because of Moore's Law and uh, analytics exponentially exploding and other things, uh, our members felt that they wanted to be kept abreast of the latest things that are going on here and there so that they could be state-of-the-art in their practice and in their research. And so we implemented that. We implemented that later that year. And I'm happy to say that even to this day, uh, INFORMS uh, offers short certificate courses that, are, that the market wants for our members. So that's one of the things. Now, I, my, my nickname is Dr. Q, and I don't know exactly how that happened. I think it happened from an uh, a, a operations research paper I wrote on the psychology of queuing in the late 20th century. And so, um, but I, will, I always, I teach queuing, and I, I, I love queuing because I hate to queue, so I'd love to figure out ways to avoid it. And I thought, well, is queuing something that we, is a service that we don't really do enough about for uh, operations research and management science? And I talked to a lot of, uh, of fellow members, and particularly academics who write papers, say, the biggest complaint I have is it takes months, if not years, from the date I submit a manuscript until I get it published. The queuing delay is outrageous. And I'm saying to myself, why don't we publish those queuing delays? And I, embarrassingly, I looked and I found out that social science journals publish their queuing delays, and they're not, they, they probably don't even know how to spell queuing. And yet we didn't. So uh, we yelled and screamed and we talked to uh, the, the uh, you know, informs of uh, editors in chief and, and those folks. And I'm happy to say that we implemented slowly over two or three years, the publication of the queuing delays for uh, processing papers. And today that's standard, all of the informs journals have that. It's uh, called part of journal metrics for each of our journals. So that's another thing I'm proud of. Dr. Q is happy about that we had a queuing intervention. And then the, the third thing, it, it's nothing, it had to do with me, but I'm so proud of our INFORMS offices, the central offices, that when the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans and related areas in the Gulf in late August 2005, devastated New Orleans, killed people, injured people, made them homeless, it was awful. Number one, we ask INFORMS members to, to donate to, to, to charities to, to, to help the victims, and, and they did generously. And also we had to figure out, well, where do we go now? And uh, the INFORM staff was marvelous. Miraculously, they located San Francisco, a hotel that could accommodate us and all the transportation and other things involved. And um, I think it was that November that we had the uh, 2005 meeting. And even though it was arranged in the last months before the meeting, it was a record meeting at the time with 3,500 attendees. So uh, I, I was proud that that happened on my watch, but the people I'm proud of is the INFORMS office. Hurricane Katrina showed that disasters can and will happen. And as we talk here in 2020, we have COVID-19. 
COVID-19 has also affected our INFORMS national meeting in Baltimore, which was supposed to be a face-to-face -face meeting. And now we're uh, having an, it's an experiment, which I'm sure it's gonna go successfully, uh, uh, our virtu a virtual meeting uh, this fall. And so uh, INFORMS people have shown that they can adjust to and adapt to uh, disasters as they have contributed to the operations research of disasters over many years. Dick, let's shift gears a little bit and look towards the future. I'm going to start with asking you, what worries you about our profession as you look to the future? That's a good question. I'm not usually a worrier, but, but, I, but I do worry about the profession going forward. And some of it has to do with the constraints and pressures on untenured operations research faculty members. Uh, at universities around the U.S. and around the world. And, uh, you know, it's publish or perish. And so there's a lot of competition. And there's certain journals that they have to get published in, et cetera. And so this environment is a risk-averse environment. It's not a risk-prone environment. So I worry that not enough uh, 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 young people, young PhDs, uh, got PhDs recently in operations research, are not taking sufficient risks because for operations research as a profession to continue to grow and to thrive, we have to take risks, we have to be disruptive in the things we look at and frame problems that haven't been identified before, frame, formulate, and hopefully solve these problems. And uh, uh, when, I, when I look at, for instance, our history, uh, our history is filled with examples of the mathematician Bernard Koopman in World War II uh, went out uh, on uh, Navy ships uh, to, with captains and, and those with binoculars looking for, uh, for, for enemy submarines. And uh, not only did he bring in the geometry and the math of, of that situation, but he brought in the psychology of vision and vision at night and different day of the light situations. And he created optimal search theory out of nothing. He identified the problem and nothing. It was so valuable. It turned around the war in the North, uh, North Atlantic and uh, we started destroying those enemy uh, submarines and, and you know the rest is history. It was so important that it was judged as it was classified as top secret for 15 years. Now there's a problem that was, had not been identified before. He identified it. He didn't view himself as a mathematician who should just think of this in his office at a blackboard. He went out and and and, and participated with those who were looking for the submarines to figure out the constraints and the environment, and the psychology, the vision, everything else, and and did that. And it, it, when I think about uh, operations research, and I think about, okay, we have linear programming, dynamic programming, we have queuing theory, uh, we have loads of different things, optimal location theory. Most of the major results in those areas would not have been identified if it hadn't been to solve a real problem. So I, know, I say that applications and theory are really one, and okay. each one needs the other. And without the other, you, have, you could have uh, dying theory, which is working on problems of, uh, of, of 1949 uh, or, or, or applications which are just using textbook algorithms there. So you, you need that thing to work together. So I go off and talk to uh, young people at universities and disappointedly I ask them this question. I said, well, when you uh, become an assistant professor uh, somewhere and you think about what topics to work on and what papers to write. Would you rather write the 999th paper on a topic first identified and written about in 1949, or would you rather write the first paper in a problem that you identify, recognizing that there may never be a second paper, or there may be 50 years of follow-on? You don't know. Unfortunately, 80% of them raised their hands for the 1949 paper to write the 999th, because it's risk averse. They can probably get it published. It, it's, not, it's not controversial, it's not risk taking, and, uh, but it's not gonna change the profession. So to move the profession forward, we need that merger of the two, and we need risk taking and disruptive thinking to look at you know, things that haven't been looked at before. Well, then I get to pose the more positive question about what excites you about the future of the profession. Okay. What excites me about the profession is that an operations researcher is a generalist scientist. And an operations researcher who's both 
deeply trained in one or more methodologies, but broadly trained to consider the human aspects of problems, the social science involved, the engineering of implementation. So you have to view yourself as multidisciplinary. But somebody with that training and that point of view, uh, and for me, for instance, I'm a, a news junkie. I devour one to two hours of news every day. It keeps me up to date on what's going on. And so I can try to identify new problems that haven't been identified before. Somebody who can do that, they can change the world. And you can bring an, an operations researcher in to a problem that they don't have any form of, 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 form of contextual knowledge of, uh, like transporting sewage sludge to the 106 mile mark in, 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 in the Atlantic Ocean. It's something that I was involved in years ago with New York City. And uh, you know, within a week or two, that person and his team or her team can contribute in major ways to framing, formulating, and solving that problem. I don't know of any other profession that has this uh, ability because most other professions operate in silos. These are academic silos, these are intellectual silos, bubbles if you want, and they don't really get out and uh, the information doesn't get into and out of the silo. An operations research person uh, doesn't operate in a silo and is broadly based and that's the, that's the kind of person who can change the world. So you look at a lot of the problems we have today, and even, even these are some of the political problems that are currently in Washington, D.C. and around the country. A lot of these, the thinking can be straightened out. Critical thinking can be straightened out with an operations research point of view. I don't mean narrowly say, well, what's the optimal solution? Optimal is a word I don't use in practice, because I, I, I think it only works in pure math. But, uh, but, but that's what an operations researcher can do. And if we continue to take risks, we continue to engage in real problems, I think the sky is the limit for operations research going forward. That's a wonderful sentiment. I wish every new junior operations researcher out there could hear those words from you and hopefully through this video they will. Um, let's just one last question as we wrap up this interview. When we think about INFORMS, our professional society, we have now this rich 25-year legacy of the society that is INFORMS. And we hope that that continues into the future. So as you look at where INFORMS and the profession are headed in the next 25 years, what is your one piece of advice that you'd like to share with us? Well, that's an excellent question. And I hope that INFORMS would configure its professional activities, its publications, uh, its awards, to reward the kind of behavior I'm talking about. Risk taking, identifying heretofore unidentified problems, at least from an OR point of view, in the initial framing, formulating, and helping to solve those problems. I, I somehow I think that if we can do that, and if we can structure the society to reward that, uh, the society has nothing to do but the sky is the limit. As one example, currently here in uh, late uh, 2000, uh, 2020, we have those raging fires in California, Oregon, and Washington. And a key problem creating these conflagrations every so many years, maybe a decade or two, is the lack of modern forest management in terms of getting rid of deadwood and then controlled burns, something Native Americans knew centuries ago about controlled burns to avoid the, the risk of conflagrations. That is a beautiful operations research problem. Waiting to be framed, formulated, and solved, I urge you all to go out and look at that. Well, we would like to thank you, Professor Larson, for joining us today and taking time to sit down with us to talk about your presidency year and past 25 years of INFORMS and the future 25 years of INFORMS. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much.